when we accept it, we collapse the trust because we control both sides of the title. We control the legal title and the equitable title when we accept the deed. We take it out of the general accounting system, and now we put it into a private accounting. In banking, it's called special deposit. We control it then. When we control it, we collapse. When we control both sides of the title or both titles, it collapses the trust. When the legal and the uh, equity title are vested in one party, there is no longer a trust. So it collapses the trust. It takes it out of their system. They no longer can control it. Now we can turn around and create an express trust with that deed and control the equity and place it in the proper place. And by doing that, now we can turn around and those who would be our dominating masters, the courts, the police, the IRS, whatever, now are reappointed as trustees and we bind them to their own law, their own legal code and requirements. And if they breach that trust, there's liability because equity acts in persona, meaning they cannot stand behind the um, uh, the veil of limited liability in the corporate world. That's how they get to do what they're doing because they don't have liability. But in equity, that doesn't exist. There's in personam and there's full liability. So on that basis, then we now have the director position of that trust or account. And I'm not going to go further on that because a lot more detail and, and pieces there and we're almost out of time. So what is the other maximum in equity that relates to commerce? That maximum is equity will not come to the, um, uh, what's the word? Um, come to the support of a volunteer. So what does that mean? It means for as long as we're a volunteer and we consented to be the volunteer surety to that public side of debt, we have no equity. Equity will not come to our support. But conversely, once we have perfected and corrected our status and we are the true owner as the beneficiary, equity will always come to our uh, our aid. And... Um, that's what we have to make the system step into or stand down from their presumption, their arrogance that they they are, are above that. Uh, it's not complete. There are many people, you know, not hundreds of thousands, but there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people pursuing this, not just in Gemstone and Pantera. There's lots of other people pursuing uh, the same kind of track to perfect standing in equity so that we can start making the public officers um, conform to what they're bound to do. But for as long as we're in commerce, I'm going to finish with this last point, they don't have to. And here's where it ties back to the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment says, Section 1, that um, uh, any person born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen thereof and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Okay, those franchises, those legal names are U.S. persons, they're citizens. Um, when you're bonded as a surety to that, you're presumed to be equal to that, so you're a U.S. citizen. That's where they control, like FATCA worldwide, you have a bank account somewhere, you're a U.S. person, they control it. Um, and in fact, where the system is going is every person on the planet will be a U.S. citizen at some point if it's not turned around. Uh, so... Um, so that's section one. Section four begins the uh, validity of the debt, the national debt, can never be challenged, including pensions and bounty in the uh, bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. That, that phrase there is, is the complete pivot point of the entire system because you go into 19, that was uh, 1868, you go to 1917, there's something called the Trading with the Enemy Act that excluded U.S. persons as under the definition of an enemy. But then you go to 1933, March 9th, the 73rd Congress, the very first act, just do a Google search, 
73rd Congress Legislative Acts, the first thing that comes up is the Emergency Banking Relief Act. And in that, the first thing it said was the president is pre-approved by the Congress to do anything under emergency rules to protect the currency. And the currency is defined, it's not there in that particular place, but it's defined as the creation of public funds, which is monetized debt in fulfillment and adherence to public policy. So then it goes on, which means that the Congress pre-approves anything the president wishes to do for it, as long as the emergency continues by proclamation or executive order or several other ways to do it. So when people yell, the president is, you know, running the show as a, as a dictator through executive order, technically he's just doing what Congress has pre-approved him to do. So it's technically adhering to the rules of the Constitution because Congress has to create the law and the executive executes it. But now they've pre-approved it and they've given him, you know, complete um, authority to do that, to do one thing, protect the currency, protect the money. And so then it says that if anybody, um, uh, hang on, let me refer to that. Um, it, then it goes on to say that the, um, the particular section in the Trading with the Enemy Act is hereby amended that any person subject to the jurisdiction of the United States is uh, controllable under this act. So this goes back to Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. Any person who's subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, where the 14th Amendment said any person born or naturalized within the United States is a citizen and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. So now the Emergency Banking Relief Act amended the Trading with the Enemy Act to say a U.S. person, which is the fictional name, is an enemy of the state. This gets into military occupation. It gets into international treaties, which I'm not going to go into. We don't have time. We'll do it next session. But the bottom line is, if you're a bonded surety to a U.S. person, then you're an enemy of the state. Now you come under the issue of insurrection and suppression of that or rebellion for Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. What does that mean? It means that as long as you have accepted the bonded charity relationship to fuse yourself, be married to your U.S. person, all cap name, then anytime you do something to harm the public against public policy, um, you are basically engaging an act of belligerence. And an act of belligerence is, is essentially the same as insurrection and rebellion. Therefore, the debt attached to that and the pensions to the officers and the bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion per Section 4 of the 14th Amendment cannot be challenged. That creates an inviolate, perpetual system of debt enslavement that can never be challenged for as long as you're bonded as the surety to that legal name, whether born or naturalized. That's why you must sever that completely and, com and completely and completely uh, comprehensively to change your status and assert that point into the system so that the system actually knows that you have done that. And that's what our status correction does. And then you stand as a living being in the land of the living, on the land, in the landed estate that is your physical body that they no longer have authority over, whether that's you know, vaccinations or anything else to your body. They cannot monetize that estate of the DNA or any of the rest of it. Yeah. And that's it. I see that. I, I see what you're saying, Ken. And I'd, I'd like to point out that there are different methods for um, injecting the system with truth. And it sounds like you're, you, you've got a good, pretty good idea about how to proceed uh, in that way. Um, let me just share how much, how much time do we have, Jolly? Well, you know, we said we'd try and keep it to close to two hours as we can for about 15 minutes over two hours at this point. So, um, you know, just to, I, let's, get, let's finish up in a few minutes now. To, just, just to illustrate what Ken was talking about, about severing this uh, relationship with the bonded surety, the name. Um, I, back when I was, uh, did not have all this knowledge that I have now about the legal name fraud, I, was, uh, I had brought suit against uh, several attorneys 
a doctor and a sheriff's deputy and, and other people. Now, this is a federal court case, and this federal court case came to a halt immediately after the judge uh, began to question me. He said, will you be represented by an attorney today? I said, no. He then asked me, will you be representing yourself today? I said, no. And then he took his glasses off of, off his face, and he was about 30 feet away, way up high, as all these uh, bar priests are. And he said something to the effect of, we have a failure to communicate. Uh, it, can you <laughs> explain yourself? And I said, I'm here today presenting this case, prosecuting this case. Um, that's all there is to it. That court case was immediately stopped, and he had us enter into his chambers with the two court recorders. And it proceeded to beg us to seek representation or to admit representing ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that was it. And when we wouldn't do it, when I wouldn't do it in those chambers in Macon, Georgia, in the federal courthouse, he then looked over to my wife, significant other, and said, you know, started working on her as best he could. And, he, and at the end of not being able to get anywhere with her, he said, would you at least consider being represented in this court case? And she said, sure, I'll consider it. And that ended the court case right there. Why? Because we, wouldn't, uh, we would not agree to represent anything in that court. Right. They were looking for agreement to represent the person at the birth certificate. Wouldn't happen in open court. So... We, you know, that was right. it. That's the power. That is the power of not being in agreement with the legal fiction. So yep. it, ended, it ended legal proceedings. It had to end because we couldn't be a party because we w weren't there to be representing a legal fiction, nor would we agree to having an attorney represent the legal fiction. So everything ended. And that, that was the first idea. That's where I first learned that this legal name thing, there's, there's a lot to it. Yeah. Yep. Sure does. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah. does anybody yeah. want to make any comments on that? Maybe jump in as well. And oh, I, I just want to thank Ken and Kira, and you, but Ken and Kira have helped me see both sides of this picture in a better way. And I am really, really grateful, and I think our audience is going to be quite appreciative of the knowledge you shared with us, Ken, and you, Cheryl. Hello, for us, it's nothing that new, but it's always good to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to say thank you, and I have no questions at this time, but I'm sure we'll have plenty next call. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ken, too, for talking to Jeff Berwick and letting us know that you were out there. Yeah, because we... <laughs> We haven't but, come across your work yet. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, let's thank Jeff for doing what he does. I really yeah. appreciate Jeff. Yeah. Um, he, he's been standing very, uh, very firm in his position. Uh, there's a lot that um, he needs to learn about this. Uh, he, he was not aware of a lot of this, and but he was open to learning. And uh, right. I very much appreciate Jeff. And uh can only say good things about Jeff in terms of appreciating what he's doing. You know, we were at the Anarchapoco uh, event in February, met a lot of great people. And, you know, everybody who's out there listening who may be feeling like, wow, that's just why I'll never understand that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, as my friend, friend Gary likes to say, um, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? <laughs> just take this one bite at a time. Yeah. Um, you will amaze yourself to learn this. And like I said, you know, grounding it in your awareness uh, will open these things up. And we live in a hologram. And the hologram, a hologram is created by wave patterns that are directed as a cross interference that creates a new pattern that an imprint of an image is put on. So the physical reality we're in is real. The floor you're standing on is real. You're not going to fall through it. What's not real is the, the holographic inserts of this construct that we're talking about in our heads. The more we ground into our, our physical reality and yes. take control of our lives and this world, the more that illusion will be 
shattered and breaking apart. Right. And so, you know, Jeff has done tremendous amount to do that by what he does with his newsletters and now the Anarchapoco uh, event. And there were four, five, six hundred people there who all went off this year after they were there. Not maybe not all, but most. And they talked to ten or twenty or fifty people, and they talked to people. And what you guys do, uh, that's why our focus is education and media. What you do on this media show and the ripples that it creates, it's opening up the awareness. So even though the listening audience, this may have been overwhelming, uh, the more you expose yourself to it, the more you open up to it, the more let go of predetermined, pre-programmed beliefs of reality, and that includes especially religion and all of those belief systems because the word religion means to bond again. Mm -hmm. Our minds have been bound and bonded to the law of the priest, and we agree to it. So stop agreeing to it. Stop yeah. consenting. Exactly. You know, so, so we are breaking through this hologram of deception and illusion. Awesome. So thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you so much, and definitely we will. Um, I'll keep. I'll keep in touch with you as to when you've time to uh, join us for one of our regular programs on uh, a Wednesday afternoon, and uh, we'll totally uh, set it up for questions and answers, and um, you know, see how many people uh, are, are sort of open to looking at this this direction. I know, you know, a lot of us have been just trying to make it very simplistic and that's the way we, we like to be because uh, life really is simple when it gets down to natural life. Uh, but, um, yeah, I completely see what, where you're going with this and not completely, but <laughs> I have a good idea. And, uh, yeah, I very much want to pursue this and, and, you know, see where we can go with it. And definitely um, by means of our... Uh, radio show uh we want to share as much of this information as we can and give people their options and you know where to go so we really appreciate you know everything you said and about you know potentially giving people scholarships and that sort of thing uh people are kind of struggling but if we can teach one two three ten hundred people just think what difference that would make so um it's really, really a wonderful thing to, to be making this connection. I really, really appreciate it. So, so thanks very much.